All right, so thanks for that great introduction. So a little bit of background about me. I spent nine wonderful years at UC Santa Barbara here. Um, yes, so it's literally, so this is UC Santa Barbara. It is surrounded by water on two sides. Uh, this, let's see, I think my lab was like here or here. And you could actually see the ocean from the lab. And so I did a, uh, did my undergrad at UC Santa Barbara, and I did, they have, like, we have it, uh, at least in SIDC, a four plus one program, so an undergrad plus an extra year for master's. So I did my master's there, and I, like maybe most of our students, was like, I am done with school, I cannot wait to go work. So I got a job at Microsoft, I went up there as a software developer for a year, uh, but during that time, I uh, wrote a paper for my master's, and that paper got, of course, like lots of papers do, rejected. And so I was working on this paper on my free time, and I remember I was on the way home from Microsoft on a bus, like reading this paper for what must have been like the 30th or 40th time. And it kind of hit me that like, wow, the thing that I'm doing at Microsoft, I'm doing something new and interesting to me. You know, I'm solving cool problems and developing things, but I'm not really doing something new, right? Um, like the research, like this paper, I'm actually doing something new that nobody's ever done before. And so I emailed my advisor like, hey, what do you think about me coming back for a PhD? Uh, and it was like the quickest email I've ever gotten a response from, from him. And so we talked about it, I applied, and so I spent a year at Microsoft, came back, did four years for my PhD at Santa Barbara, and was lucky enough to get a job here at ASU. I started, well, in 2014. So this is, I've been here for two years. It feels like it's gone by incredibly quickly. Um, and so yeah, I'm really excited to be here. So this is a little bit about my background. While I was there, I uh, competed on a hacking team called Shellfish. Um, so they actually are doing, it's kind of sad, as soon as I left, they started doing really, really good in a bunch of <laughs> hacking competitions. Uh, there was recently this cyber grand challenge from DARPA where they developed autonomous systems to try to hack into each other. And so they actually won third place in that competition that was held in Las Vegas, uh, I think last month. And so now I'm, you know, in case you know, I'm sure you've seen it, Tempe campus, it looks a lot different than, uh, than West campus as I'm finding out. And so I moved here. I'm super excited to be at ASU. I started my own or resurrected an old hacking group called the Pwn Devils. And we meet actually Thursdays from four to six. So I'm meeting, missing today's meeting. Uh, we meet and I'm trying to get them up to the level where we can compete in these pretty intense hacking competitions. So that's a little bit about my background. And I think you know, we're not a ton of people here so we can keep this pretty informal. If you have any questions or anything as I'm going along and talking and I know we're a very diverse bunch, right? So any questions or something, or I use weird terminology or jargon, please stop me. Just, you say something, raise your hand, I don't really care, I'm very, very open. Cool, so our laboratory, Sethcom, uh, so I co-direct that with Dr. Gail June Ahn, and so he very graciously offered to kind of join forces when I got here and create an awesome, strong lab. So we have, this is from one of our meetings, we just have tons of students, It's a little overwhelming, but PhD students, master's students, some undergrad students, and um, so that's kind of where our research focus is. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, about so we, I think as far as last January, we started the Center for Cybersecurity and Digital Forensics. So, and that's something that Gail is doing and is kind of leading, and so Sethcom is kind of, I guess, under that umbrella, but this is part of the Global Security Initiative. Um, and so the idea is there's kind of like three areas. We work on education, we're working on research, and entrepreneurship. And so we're working with partners. We have, I think PayPal is working with us, Samsung and Allstate are kind of the these latest confirmed partners that we have working with us in this center. So we have tons of people across all kinds of institutions. I, I guess I'm the one on the far left. Uh, what's kind of cool is we also, the center is very interdisciplinary. We have people from the business school uh, who look at the kind of cybercrime aspect from the sociological standpoint and kind of interviewing and trying to understand how crime happens. Uh, tons of people, lots of research activities and proposals. Um, these are from this, uh, the members here. Some of the cool things that I'm really excited about. So I'm leading this on-demand cyber competition. So. Um, what I've done in my grad class is at the end of 
the semester, I have a capture the flag and in class hacking competition. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun, the students love it, but it's a ton of work for me to set everything up and make sure that infrastructure is all ready to go so that they can hack into each other, have fun, but also not do any damage. And so what we're doing is we're kind of, we're gonna create basically a website where you can go to and say, I want to do a security competition. I need three teams. These are the service, these are the vulnerabilities I wanna have. And then we'll generate everything in the cloud for you, this whole game. So all you have to do is play Go and everyone can play. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Hopefully, well, I don't wanna make any public statements on when that'll be done. Um, so yeah, we have lots of, of research here. And so this is kind of just like background of where I am where kind of cyber, like security is in SIDC. And so now I want to talk about the computer that's in our pocket, right? It's kind of weird to think about. I mean, I'm not that young. I'm not that old, but I'm also not that young compared to our students. So I remember not having a network connected device with me at every moment of every day, right? And even if you think about how useful these devices are, I used it to, it was giving me directions on my drive up here. I was listening to a podcast on the way here. When I got here, I was able to look up Jennifer's email and then find her phone number and give her a call so I knew where to go. She told me to go to the library. I knew it was by a Starbucks, so I looked up where the Starbucks was on Google Maps so I could know where to go. Um, yeah, look, just this tiny little device. Actually, I guess I'm lying because it's not actually in my pocket. I put it away, but you know. This, it's, a, it's a computer, right? Fundamentally, these mobile devices, mobile phones, are computers, right? And so we have many different, I guess maybe just a rough, who has an Android phone? I'm trying to see what the majority is, like three people, iPhones? That's me. Anybody have a Windows phone? Sad. My brother had one for a while. I used to work at Microsoft, so I always feel like, I always, I always want to root for them, right? <laughs> They have enough. <laughs> they have enough. They want to be everywhere, though. They're already, you know. Um, so, the idea, so, what makes these mobile devices interesting from a security perspective, right? So I'm, fundamentally at heart, I'm really a hacker. I love breaking into things and exploiting vulnerabilities. Um, and part of that is understanding, so you, in order to create defenses, you need to have the offensive capabilities, right? You need to be able to know how bad guys think and how they're going to react. And so, especially coming from, if you think about maybe early 2000s, right, on a classic Windows machine, every program that you execute is executing as you, right? You're a user. So when you downloaded uh, the Melissa virus or some email attachment, and you double clicked on that and it executed on your computer, now it could do anything you could do and access all of your data, right? It's a pretty serious problem. So when we move to mobile applications, one of the, actually the key things I like to point to of security research is we actually learned from that. And what we've done in all these different operating systems and devices is saying like, okay, it shouldn't be the case that this Maps application should be able to access my music in iTunes. Right? Those are completely separate things. They should never be able to do that. Or even worse, what about my contact list? Do I want the weather app to be able to read my contact list? Should they be able to read my photos? And so we've kind of, so this is what, like the big switch to mobile devices is these applications that you can go to the Google store, you can go to the iPhone, the, Android, the iTunes store, download one of these applications on your phone, and it's running in its own little tiny sandbox and really it's difficult to break out of that and mess with other applications. So this really, I, I see this as a big win in the direction of security of mobile applications. Um, and they're everywhere, right? They're exploding. This is a report from a year ago that said that there's 1.4 billion active Android devices, right? Not just Android devices sold, but around the world, 1.4 billion Android devices being used. To me, that's crazy, right? All of these, running these software, running these apps on all of these devices. And how many apps are there? So I just pulled this up, so there was 1.2 million free apps in the Android marketplace, and there's about only 200 and 
uh, 200,000 apps that are currently like paid applications. And so there's a lot of apps out there that are running on a lot of people's phones. So some of the questions we ask as security researchers are A, are any of these apps maybe bad, right? Are they doing malicious things? Are they stealing your contact information? Are they trying to get more access to all your sensitive information on your phone? And we also think, are any of these applications vulnerable, right? So vulnerability is a software, a weakness in the code of the application that allows a malicious either user or other app to influence and change the behavior of that application. So the way to think about it is uh, a vulnerability would be in your house if you left, let's say, easy one, the front door open, right? You don't want anybody to get into your house, but they just come twist the doorknob and get into your house, right? And so other things would be an open window, even if it's on the second story where there's a tree nearby, so I could scale the tree to get into your house on the second story, right? That could be another vulnerability. And so a lot of what my research has been is I started during my PhD on web applications is can we automatically find vulnerabilities in web applications? And so I've kind of extended that to mobile applications and say can we find applications that have that are vulnerable and have vulnerabilities? And this way we can actually contact the developers, try to show either that hey there's a big problem out there, so how can we try to fix that? Um, and so that's really the core of what I'm going to talk about today is two projects that look into uh, trying to analyze all these free apps to try to understand, you know, are developers writing good secure apps? They're humans, like I tell my security class, so there's bound to be problems. But we want to know what those problems are so that we can identify how to fix and prevent them from happening in the future. Any questions? Cool. Okay, so this may be this may seem like a pretty fine distinction, but when you have an app on your phone, right, Android or iPhone, and usually you go to an app store, you install it on your device, and that contains some what they call code. So it's usually a native application. So that's running code on your device. It's running usually in the case of, let's say, Java code on your device. Unfortunately, what this means, we saw there's three different app manufacturers. So if you want to make an app that works on the iPhone and Android and Microsoft, you now need to code your app in Java for Android, C Sharp for uh, the iPhone, and what is it? No, no, C, Objective C for the iPhone. There we go. And C Sharp for the uh, for Microsoft Windows, right? And so. The maintenance overhead there, now you have three different copies of your app, so anytime you make one fix, you have to propagate that fix to the other apps. You're duplicating a lot of functionality and a lot of resources. It's really very wasteful. And so what people have done is they've realized, wow, actually, web browsers are very good at rendering and showing content. So what they've, we've noticed a trend in that people are writing what we call mobile web apps as opposed to a mobile app. So the idea is when you open up, click up on that app, instead of it running native like Java code on your browser, it basically embeds a web browser like Chrome or Firefox into that app, and, but it looks to you like you're using an app. And so it's using web technologies to make this application. So it's using JavaScript and HTML and CSS to load this web page to show you this awesome cat club thing. <laughs> and so you, so from the developer's perspective, this is awesome because I can write one app and I can sell it on all the three marketplaces and that core logic remains the same, but I can deploy it to all these three different marketplaces. But isn't that more vulnerable then if it's using the web as a platform, so to speak? Yeah, so that's actually the, exactly the key thing. So. When they kind of released this feature, they kind of released it and were like, okay, here it is, it's just out there, you can use this, and people started using it, but I think they developed, like the Android team developed this without thinking through the security implications there. And so that's really what we're gonna do here is look into, okay, why, what specifically makes this vulnerable, and there's something that makes this really bad, 
and then we study the prevalence across a large number of apps to say, okay, but you know, how often does this actually happen, right? Because for security, we're not, we don't just care about problems, we care about prevalent, impactful problems, right? We wanna find and fix bugs that affect 50% of those 1.4 billion Android users, not point, well, still I guess there even point one would maybe be a lot of users, but you know, <laughs> a small number of users that's not quite as, as important and impactful. So the idea, so, Browser-based web applications, basically, or what we call mobile web applications. Now, normally these are fine, right? You have a browser on your phone. So what's the problem of having an app basically masquerade as a browser, right? When you browse to Cat Club in your browser on Chrome on your Android device, you're not really worried that Cat Club's gonna steal your pictures and the same thing on your computer, right? When you're on your browser in Safari or whatever, and you visit a website, most times you don't have to worry that it's gonna break out of the browser and start stealing and wrecking havoc. So the same thing really does apply here. So if you're just using it like a normal website, it's really fine. It's pretty much the same security concerns that you have when using the browser on your phone. The problem then becomes, well, now I can't write an application that does the same things as a native Java application, right? My native Java application can do cool things, right? It can make the call dialog box pop up to make a call automatically. It can, depending on your permissions, it could read your pictures or access, you know, things that you tell it you want it to do, but in the browser, the browser can't do that. It has no way of doing this. And so to get around that, so these people want to write mobile web apps, but they're not fundamentally not as expressive, not as powerful as these native apps. So rather than making them kind of a second class citizen, the Android team said, aha, we will create this Java, this, what they call this JavaScript bridge. We'll build a bridge <laughs> between the browser and the native part of the application. And so essentially what happens is the Java code in the JavaScript code, the JavaScript, the Java code says, uh, so this is setting up the bridge, the specifics aren't really important, but the add JavaScript interface means that now JavaScript can access this Java object by using this variable f. So it creates a bridge between the native functionality and the application code that should be sandboxed and fine in a browser now it can access all the native parts of the application. And so, once again, we think, well, this shouldn't be a problem because you're a developer, you created this Cat Club app. You're not gonna do anything bad with this. You're explicitly turning on this bridge for yourself, right? You wanna cross this bridge and access the data, and that's fine, the user wants you to do that. So it seems like it's fine, but, so, Anyway, so we can set that up, then this JavaScript code can cross the bridge to access Java objects. And as we said, this gives us fully featured mobile web apps and we can expose phone functionality to JavaScript. It actually makes it very powerful and elevates these mobile web apps to the same functionality level as any other application. And on top of that, there's all these frameworks that people can use so that that way you can write your app to the framework so you get a fully featured web app on every single platform. So you only have to write, let's say, a Cordova app, as I think is what the framework's called, and then it works on every single cross-platform device. So they take, they take care of handling those low-level details of JavaScript bridge differences between iPhone and Android and all those things. Unfortunately, so from a security perspective, we want to know and answer some questions like, who can access this bridge, right? You can think of this bridge as a link between this website code and your phone, right? We'd hope that that bridge is mediated and only good people can access those things. I probably you know, would not be talking about it if the case was everything is fine, right? So um, it turns out anyone can access this and we'll see exactly what I mean by anyone. So typically in a web browser, you go to some random website, right? So here, let's say this is the Huffington Post. And there's actually, if you look you know, really carefully, you'll see that there's actually things on this page that are not from the Huffington Post. 
right? Like this ad for Hulu Plus, right? Like the Huffington Post wants this ad to be there because they get paid for it, but they don't actually control the content that's inside this ad. Uh, the same thing with this hotel, I think it's a Marriott hotel ad, the Hulu ad, and also even those little buttons up there of the Facebook like button, which told you how many people like that page, 4.3 million, uh, the Twitter follow button, and the Google Plus follow button that had 3.1 million. All of those is little bits of code that actually comes from Facebook, Twitter, Hulu, and Marriott. So in your browser, when you go visit this, the browser, I'm not gonna get into details, but the browser knows to separate these things. You wouldn't wanna load an ad that suddenly changes the entire content of the page and completely messes with the Huffington Post. Same as with these little like buttons. You wouldn't want a like button to know what other things you're clicking on and be able to steal information about what you're doing on this site. So the browser is very good about keeping these things separated in a normal web browser that you use. So really it gives complete isolation. So everything is very isolated. The Marriott hotels can't mess with Hulu and neither of them can mess with Huffington Post. This is why we can do very cool things like have ads on a website that the website doesn't control. Without all this, everything falls apart. So on, back to our mobile devices. When we open up, let's say this Huffington Post in our mobile web app, and now we've added this bridge to make a bridge between this JavaScript code and this Java code. Now, Huffington Post can cross this bridge after the bridge is established, but so can Hulu and Marriott. They can access this bridge because of the permission model that this bridge uses. And so, and to make matters even worse, so let's think about this, when you have two tabs open in your browser. Does anybody use multiple tabs? I use about 50. Yeah. It's actually kind of embarrassing. I usually close it out before I teach so my students don't see how many tabs I have open. <laughs> right? So uh, as part of that isolation in the browser, tabs can't mess with each other. Right? You can open up whatever malicious bad site you want to, and if you're on Facebook.com, they can't mess with each other or talk to each other. The same thing when you click on a link. You're on Google.com, you click on a link that takes you somewhere else, that new page can't mess with anything from Google and Google can't mess with that page at all. They're also completely separated from clicking on links. Unfortunately here, if you were to click on one of these links on Huffington Post while this bridge is created, and let's say you went to YouTube, the bridge is still available for oh. this brand new YouTube page to access. Yeah, it's really a terrible model. Um, and it causes a lot of problems. And so now, so now you're developing a mobile web app. You want to make it secure. So what do you have to do? You have to ensure that on your app, you don't load any content from anybody else. Right? If you load any Hulu ads or any kind of ads that you don't control, you don't know. They could access this bridge and be accessing your user's data, which you don't want. Furthermore, you need to make sure that on your mobile app, any link that the user clicks that goes to a site you don't control, you disallow that. Otherwise, that site could then access this bridge. And so we came up, we studied this problem, we came up with some principles of what we think developers need to think about when they're writing mobile web apps and they want to write them securely. Uh, to, and these are kind of what we've been talking about here is to not render untrusted content, so content from Hulu or Marriott, uh, preventing navigation or framing content, uh, using HTTPS, so HTTP, the S in HTTPS stands for secure, so this means there is a secure encrypted link between you and the server that you're talking to. Otherwise, if you don't have that, anybody who's listening on that connection can change and inject content into your page. This is especially something you think about when you're at Starbucks on a public Wi-Fi. Anybody else on that public Wi-Fi can A, see what you're browsing and looking at if you're using HTTP, and B, if they're really bad, they can inject malicious things into that response. So if you're developing a mobile web app, it's even more imperative, and you're using this JavaScript bridge, 
that you use HTTPS because otherwise anybody else can inject some JavaScript code that goes along that bridge and does bad things. And others that I won't get into. And so after we kind of decided on, okay, this is the problem and here's how we should do things correctly, we wanted to ask the question, well, are developers actually doing this correctly? And so to do this, we, um, we wanted to understand how many mobile web apps are vulnerable. How many of them actually use the, the web, the bridge, right? If nobody uses this feature, then it doesn't matter. We don't talk about it, right? It's just a problem that some people do, but it's not a widespread issue. And how many of them do this in a way that we consider vulnerable? And so we, uh, at that point, we used 1.1 million free apps. So we developed a crawler that's crawling apps from the Google Play Store, downloaded a bunch of free apps, and we analyzed every single app and developed a bunch of different analyses to try to answer these questions, to try to understand what URLs are they opening? Like what URL is shown in this mobile browser? Is it a local file? Is it from a remote server? Are they using HTTPS or HTTP? Um, and then we tried to understand all these different things. So we, some of the cool results, a lot of applications, a significant amount, use a browser to show content. This was something that really surprised us. And this, this is kind of, you can think of this as an over approximation, right? Because a single app could, let's say for its EULA, the end user license, end, end user license agreement, could use a mobile a embedded browser. It doesn't necessarily have to be the entire app uses this. But we found that 359,000 use the JavaScript bridge. So a significant amount were using this really, to, in my mind, fundamentally flawed feature. It's really diff, so you, know, you can always code something or write something in a secure or insecure way, but if you're using a technology where the default is to write it insecure or that it's hard to make it secure, you're gonna have a lot of problems. People are going, developers are just like you know, us, they're humans, they do the easiest possible thing that works. And we found that 279,000 had at least one security violation from the one that we talked about. So we found that a lot of these apps are actually doing this incorrectly. And so some of the highlights, so this is something I really like, so um, zooming in on one facet, so uh, the S in, so HTTPS uses SSL, which is the Secure Socket Library. Wow, this is a really acronym heavy day for me. Um, and the idea here is this is the low level protocol that makes the connection to the server. Now. A key problem is how do you know when you go to https colon slash slash google.com that the server you're talking to is actually google.com and not Adam pretending to be google.com or big scary government agency pretending to be google.com, right? And so SSL has a way of verifying this. And so part of what as an app developer what you can do is you can write a little function, a little method that says, what do you do if you receive an error, right? And if you want to be secure, what should you do if you receive an error? Take care of it. Yeah, you should like <laughs> kill the connection, stop, don't go any further, right? This is bad. We should not do that. And so what we did is we looked at this and we said, okay, you can either proceed, just like keep going with what you're doing, you can cancel or you can load a different URL. And we found that a significant amount of apps, so 269,000 implemented a function of what to do if there was an SSL error, and 29% of those ignore every single error, completely negating the benefits of using HTTPS. Hmm. And so we kind of dug a little bit more and we tried to understand why. The big culprit was Stack Overflow. So we actually found, so Stack Overflow is a developer uh, website where developers can ask questions and other people answer. So people ask questions like, I'm writing an Android app and I'm getting this SSL error. And so somebody says, oh, how to fix this? You write this on received SSL error method and ignore all errors. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the exact similar code we saw in multiple apps. So we think that developers just they run into these problems, right? They don't really understand why the app is not working. 
And that by doing this, they're deliberately making their apps less secure, but they just know that it works. Instead of really taking care of the error. Exactly, instead of understanding why is this error occurring. And it could happen because you're using a private, you know, an SSL certificate that's private to use, but um, still, you know, the easy way to fix it is just to, like not ever think about that problem anymore, right? <laughs> And it's natural. It's like, you know, I, I'm not disparaging developers. I was this developer before I was in security. So uh, I understand their mindset and where they're coming from. Cool. Oh, yeah. So we saw all the posts. So, yeah, that's right. There's more on this. So we had 128 posts included this, and 117 ignored all errors on all code paths. So there's a lot of misinformation, let's say, and be generous out there. Um, yeah, so it was just like, hey, here's what you do. Fix everything. Awesome. Cool. Oh, and as a little case study of this, so we wrote this up in a paper that we published last year. Um, we also tested a lot of different Android devices, and what we found, anybody have an Amazon Fire tablet? Yeah. Yeah? Oh, boy. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we found out, so the default browser in here is this one, the Silk, Silk. browser? Yeah. yeah, which is like a special, it's a fork of, so Amazon is, the Fire OS is a fork of the Android operating system. So it still uses that base internals there. So they developed their own browser. What we found out was that this Silk browser was created a JavaScript bridge in every single page that it loaded on the internet. So literally any page that you could go to, and it was actually even worse than this because for this version, I didn't get into this, but uh, there was a vulnerability in if you even had JavaScript bridge you could execute arbitrary code on the device. So we wrote really cool websites where you could go to and you could just like brick your phone. Like you click one thing on a website and it just like your phone's dead and you have to hard restart it. Or you, you could download something and steal all the cookies in your browser and do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so we talked to Amazon and they fixed it. They're actually really good about this. They um, released a patch, I think it's been like one or two weeks and they're able to like force upgrade all of these things. So they had like a 99% patch rate in a matter of days. So really good. And they sent me a free Amazon Fire tablet. So now I have one too. So oh, that was nice. Kind of nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. OK, so that's the work we've done on kind of mobile web apps. And this is really what got me started in working on Android uh, because I have the web background, so I really like this area because it's a combination of web stuff and mobile stuff. So this kind of helped me get my feet wet. So for the follow-up project, we then tried to say, okay, we have a lot of apps. What are other security questions we can ask and answer? And so we found out, and this is always, so if you ever want to, this is what I tell my students too, if you ever want to like find vulnerabilities or problems, read the specifications very carefully and think about if I was super lazy, which a lot of people are, how would I do this wrong, right? And what would, would an easy way to be to do this wrong? And so, after some digging, what we found out was on Android, so every Android app specifies a minimum what they call SDK number. We can think of this as just operating system version number. So this is a number that just specifies, hey, I can only, I have to be installed on at least Android 7. I actually don't, maybe bad to admit this in public, but I actually don't use an Android phone. I use the iPhone, so I don't remember all the marshmallows and <laughs> jelly bellies and different versions here. But basically that's what you're saying is, I only want my app, my app only works on 4.4 and above. So this is what the minimum sets is the minimum. The target SDK number says, I've tested it on this version. This is the version that I'm targeting. So you could have a low minimum, right? You could work on, let's say, any Android device 2.0 or greater, but you've tested on 4.4. And so we'll see how this target SDK number is actually used. But this is one of the choices you make as an app developer. And it makes sense, right? You don't want your app to be installed on devices that can't run it because you're using newer features. And this target SDK allows you to say, hey, I've tested it against this latest, whatever version you've actually tested it against. And so the developer reference is filled with language like if the device is running Android 6.0 or higher, 
and your app's target SDK is 6.0 or higher, the app must request each dangerous permission that it needs while the app is running. And so, this was a recent change in Android 6.0, so why is this important? Android made a big deal about in the new version of Android, apps have to request each dangerous permission that it needs while the app is running. This is a cool security feature, it's very good. The key problem here is in this AND, right? If it applied to any device running Android 6.0, then you as a user, you wanna be more secure, you wanna take advantage of this awesome new feature, you just upgrade your OS to Android 6.0, and now you're good. No, but your app. Yes, but the problem is, the random app that you install has to also have a target SDK of 6.0 or higher. And it makes sense when you think about it from the Android people's perspective, because they don't want to break apps, right? If you upgrade your operating system, you don't want then all of your apps to break when you try to run them. But the problem is, is they make some functionality changes in this target SDK with security changes so you as a user don't actually have control over getting the latest and greatest security benefits. You're at the mercy of app developers saying, yes, I target a later version. And this problem, well, and so there's other types of areas. So uh, yeah, so basically the key problem is this, these compatibility behaviors. So Android 6.0, if you're running an app that targets Android 1, it will disable all the security features that have been implemented from one to six nice. for your application. And so we used a similar data set where we had a little bit more data. So we had 1.2 million Android apps. So once we found this out, we're like, this is crazy. But if developers are using it correctly, then it's not really a problem, right? And so we need to understand, is this actually a problem? Um, so we had a, a lot of metadata about each of the applications. Uh, we collected them, we collected for a long time. A uh, little update on this, I guess. We are, I think we're current, we were at like 1.4 million Android apps, and then we decided a lot of them are old because some of them were from May 2012. So I should say these are distinct apps. So different apps by different developers. Uh, yeah, so not multiple copies of the same app. Um, and so what we're doing now is we're going through and doing a brand new crawl of all of the Android apps and getting the latest version of every single app so we have a fresh data set to work with. Then over time we want to do cool things like how things change over time and all that, but we're still dealing with the massive amounts of storage this needs. But that's fun things for a PhD student. <laughs> so the question is, how do we actually measure this, right? So we know this is a problem, we know the fact that you can target a super old version of Android, but one of the key questions is how do we actually quantify that to try to measure it? And so we use a measure we're gonna call outdatedness. So the idea is if we have an app that we've collected and it targets Android 5.0, but by the time we collected it, Android 6.0 was already released, really the developer should have updated it within this time to target this new operating system. I mean, in an ideal world, that's what we would want. And so we use the amount of days in between the Android 5.0 and the Android 6.0 release as saying like, hey, this is how out of date your app is. Is or was? Was when we downloaded it, okay. yes. So this is kind of, for each app, this is a snapshot of when we got this app, how out of date is it? And so this is a CDF of all of the graphs of all of the apps that we had and their outdatedness. And you can actually see that there's a lot of apps, about 50, I think it's about 50% is probably about here. It's like about 50% of apps are about 500 days out of date and targeting old, old Android versions. And so then we tried to say, well, is it maybe just a problem with less popular apps? Right? Because if popular apps are not having this problem, then we don't have to worry about it as much. So this graph breaks down the download count. And so this blue line on the far left, so the way to read uh, this CDF is the more left the line is, the better it is. Right? So that means that for a given percentage number, 50%, it had less um, 
outdatedness as opposed to other apps. But there's not a huge difference. So the blue is greater than 10 million, but it's not significantly far over, right? These are still, these apps are still frequently out of date. And then we tried to see, is there a difference in time? Because we're using the collection of the apps to determine this. And so we compared a January 2014 data set with our December 2015 data set. And they're you know, roughly equivalent, right? There's not any huge surprising differences here. So it seems like this is a problem that has throughout, been throughout the lifetime of the App Store and um, affects all apps regardless of popularity. But it's kind of unfair, right? Because we collected this app here, but what if it was updated maybe right after Android 1.5.0 in between 5.1, right? Should the developer be penalized because they never released an update of their app in two years, right? They're busy people. Maybe they don't have time to develop, to release these apps. So what we did is we used uh, what we call a, this is a little bit of shaming naming, uh, negligent outdatedness is saying like, hey, you, you pushed a new version of your app to the App Store, yet you still target Android 5.0, even though there was Android 5.1 that was already released. So if you were really on top of your game, we're not going to fault you for the fact that we collected it here for all of this time. But really, if, we, if you updated it, you should really target the latest version of Android at the time. So it turns out it's about the same. <laughs> it's still it's a little bit better, but still there's a lot of apps that are not either, and it's hard to tell, right? We can't really get in the mindset of these developers. I don't know if they're just, they, I think you know, the, probably the simplest explanation is they just don't know the importance of doing this, right? They don't know that by not updating their target SDK version, because to them the app still works, right? Why would I change something on the app that could make it break, right? Even though I get these awesome security benefits and my users get these security benefits, but you as a user don't know because you don't know which thing it's targeting, so which security features it gets or it doesn't get. And so what our kind of core argument when we started looking at this is, hey, mixing security features and security updates to the Android platform with this target SDK version is crazy because you're putting, you're making the developers make this choice of, man, do I just keep this working app or do I target this latest version? But now maybe there was other changes that changed the functionality of my app and my app may break. So you know what, I'm just gonna stick with this latest one and nobody's gonna get any of those security benefits. Um, and the, by coupling security and non-security changes, that's a huge issue and a huge problem. Uh, because now, and I think it's a bad model, because really, you know, ideally if you want to do this correctly, you'd have kind of two different routes, right? You have maybe security updates and another one of feature updates or something. And you could choose one or the other. Um, and so, yeah, I don't like this model. And so we just published this uh, paper earlier this year. Okay, cool. Well, that's right about on time. So this is. A br uh, overview of some of the work we've done on mobile security. So I'd be happy to take questions and talk with everyone. Yeah? No, probably a trivial question. Nope. When your graph, you had several graphs up there that showed yes. how much out of date. Yes. It seemed like in the ones that had multiple lines, ones where you're looking at the number of downloads, let's yes. say, some very distinct peaks. Is that I mean, I mean, ah, 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 good question. I'm, yes. I'm just one who works with uh, previous, yeah, there. Yep. There. I, I work with ecological data. Mm -hmm. When you look at uh, a million data points, I never get peaks like that. So my guess is that has something to do with the date a particular system upgrade was done. And because you only yes. have three systems, and really you only have Android and the others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, this is, so yeah, those peaks are basically. I agree exactly because we are doing time deltas in between the target version of the app and the latest, depending on the time, of the Android release. So each of those is like fixed offsets in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends on the delta between each of the release dates of Android. Right. So yeah, they're going to fall into those buckets and some of them are going to be 
worse than others, basically. So can that be used as a hint on how to get people to adopt things faster? I mean, it definitely shows something has a huge influence on behavior. Right. Can, can, can that be manipulated? I don't know. <laughs> I would love to uh, think about that, and you know, I would love the Google people to change how they do these things. And I think it's, I think the other matter is education. By not educating, so the other problem that we found that I didn't get into here is you can actually, when you're writing your app, you can leave off minimum SDK and target SDK, and then both of them default to one, the very first Android release. Which, yeah, it's crazy, because you're missing out on all this stuff. And we found that if a good percent, not all of them, it's not all due to that fact that they're all so outdated, but there are a lot of them that target the very first Android version. Could it not be an education issue, but more so a, a business decision? It, which I, would, yeah. I mean, which would stink um, <laughs> if, if people really knew that, but yeah. since not everybody is, is privy to this kind of information, um, they just, nobody complains about it. Yeah, I think it's a combination. I think it's exactly. Like, I think there's developers, because the other thing with the Android marketplace, right, you have professional, you know, Google, Microsoft, Facebook writing these apps. And then you have average developers, like students doing it in their spare time, just having fun. Yeah. And so I think there's definitely unawareness parts. And I like, I guess maybe I'm thinking I'm biased because I want that to be the answer because I can do something about educating them or at least try to, uh, whereas like, it's hard for me to change their mind about business. If they know and they're making the rational decision that, no, I want to keep this target and not do any of that, then my response would be Google should take that decision out of their hands. Well, but see, what you presented up there, that statement of, hey, here are these great new security features, mm -hmm. me reading that would be like, oh, that's great. I have no idea what an SDK, but I'm yeah. cool, great. Yeah. I'm sorry, I guess I'm more of a suspicious person. I tend to think that they do know what they're doing. I think, so from Google's to perspective, a certain extent. yes. I, I, I think Google has definitely made the conscious decision. So it's about, they don't want to break backwards com or yeah. forwards compatibility, right? They don't want an app that works on Android 5 to fail on Android 6. And that's, I think, the main their main goal. I mean, Microsoft was famous for this. I don't know if you've heard the stories, but they, I think when they were doing, was it Windows 95, the one after or XP or one of the ones, oh, they ran through and ran every single app they could find. And so they put specific shims and little changes in that said, if you're running SimCity, because SimCity has this bug on this other operating system, we need to actually emulate that bug on the new version of Windows so that SimCity continues to work. Yeah, I think it was Vista. Or is it Vista? Yeah, there's been, it had, that's like Microsoft's thing is, is we want any app that has ever been written from Windows should continue working. Actually, what I tell, especially my grad students, this is one of the best things about working at a university because I have the cover of research, yeah. you know, behind me, and I have the weight of the university behind me if something would happen. Yeah. Uh, but it is something. So there's a couple things there. One thing I'm always thinking about when we do these. So for this, right, I'm downloading the app and I'm running it in my own environment, right. So I know here I'm not affecting anybody else. Some of the web stuff we do is we do go out there and crawl and look for vulnerabilities on the web because we need to measure those kinds of things. But we try to do that in a way that's not gonna cause harm to people. Okay. Um, and so I've, I've gotten all kinds of feedback. No <laughs> legal threats, but I did, uh, I wrote a tool to find bugs in Ruby on Rails apps, and I emailed all the developers I found, that I found problems with, mm -hmm. and there was one person that absolutely refused to believe and wrote me a really long, mean email about why I was wasting his time and like spamming him, and it's clearly not a vulnerability. And then I looked, because sometimes the tools make mistakes. I looked, and I'm like, no, actually, like, you know, I proved to myself, yes, it is vulnerable, and so I you know, explained to him exactly how it could be vulnerable and stuff, and then another huge, long reply about how I was wrong and I should never bother him, and uh, even though his email is publicly available, attached to a GitHub, GitHub account, so. You know, people, there's all kinds of people, so you just, you help the ones that you can help, 
Um, but you do have to do it in a responsible manner, the way you're, you know, telling people and reporting to them. So I personally haven't had any problems, but I've definitely heard horror stories. Sure. Yeah. Uh, if there are no other questions, let's thank you. Cool.